Morning, everybody. Um, in the event of an emergency, there's two means of egress for this uh, room. You can either exit to your left or right over here, or either over there. Uh, we will basically congregate in the parking lot. Uh, myself or either Donna will basically take the head count, ensure that everybody is safely evacuated from the room. In the event of a medical emergency, I am uh, first aid certified. I will be the first one to contact uh, EMS should that be needed. Thank you. That concludes my safety contact. Thank you. Okay, hey, I'd like to ask Donna to please hold on. Uh, Director Brown will be absent today. Director Downey. Uh, Director Dutra. And, uh, Director Collinsbury Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lynn. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Newsom. Present. Director Pagler. Here. Director P. Rose Carter. Here. And Director Rockton will be absent today. Ex officio Director Henderson. Here. And ex officio Director Northcott. And we do have quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. Just a couple of announcements that today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And we have um, Spanish interpretation available uh, through Maria Avila from the Language Line Services. This time. <laughs> See your name. My name is Maria. I'm here for any interpretation services in Spanish. Thank you so much. I didn't realize you were here in person. Perfect. <laughs> okay, with that, we'll go to agenda item number five, board of director comments. Any comments from directors? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move to agenda item six, oral and written communication to the board. Um, is there any? Okay. Is there anyone? Yeah, so. Is there anyone here who'd like to make oral communication? <coughs> anyone online? <coughs> okay. Moving on to item seven, labor organization communication. There are none. Okay. Moving along to item eight, additional documentation to support existing agenda items. There are none. Moving to consent. That is items 9.1 through 9.11. Are there any questions or any items that um, you have comments or need to be pulled from the board? Okay, is there anyone in the public who wishes to make a comment on consent items 9.1 to 9.11? I'm assuming no one online. And, all right. The consent agenda. Right. All right. We had moved by Pinkler and seconded by Cody. And we'll do a roll call vote. Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Cohen. Perry Johnson. Aye. Director Cohen. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Pagler. Aye. And Director P. Rose Carter. Aye. And we in the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to our regular agenda. Item 10 is presentation and longevity awards. Um, and I believe there are some of our employees here. So let me just um, read the names and ask you to, to stand up if you are here so that I know you're here. Efren Arellano, I'm so, excuse me if I'm for mispronouncing. Okay, um, Josefina Cruz. Jose Escobar, David Horvath. Okay, wonderful. Then I'll come up and um, ask you to come up, David Horvath. Thank you for serving the Metro. There we go. Wow, look at that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for your 10 years of service. Thank you, yeah. Really appreciate it. Would you like to see a I was hoping that my uh, Metro siblings, Joe, Manny, Josie, and Efren would be able to make it today, but I guess they're out doing what we do. Um, I remember when we finished training in August of 2013, seems like yesterday, we went to uh, the board meeting 
at Scotts Valley City Hall to be introduced to the to the board and the riding public. And uh, just like that, 10 years went on by. So I wanted to say thanks to Metro and uh, our wonderful riding public for 10 great years and looking forward to attending. Thank you so much yeah. for all your work. Here, see if anyone else is here. Manuel Perez? No, okay. And Mitchell Dupas? All right. Um, I'll go back to my scene. I do have a bio for Mitch. Mitch is a dispatcher schedule. scheduler. He was just 27 years old when he started to work at Metro Paracruz. Back then, he was just trying to make monthly payment on his Toyota truck and have a little leftover for food. 15 years later, he's now happily married to his wife, Mara, and has two wonderful children, Maddie, six years old, and Marissa, nine years old. The Metro has, provi has provided me and my family the ability to live comfortably, have great benefits, and eventually a great retirement. Mitch enjoys spending time with his daughters, Marissa and Maddie, mountain biking when he has time. His daughters usually keep him busy barbecuing, relaxing, and enjoying Santa Cruz County's beautiful beaches, parks, and beautiful weather. So thank you to Mitch, and thank you to everyone who has received a Longevity Award today. Just a round of applause for everyone. Okay. I am going to move on to item 11, which is the retire re retiree resolution of appreciation for Dilly Frubeck. Are you here? No. Okay. She's not online. She's not online. I'm going to take a moment and read parts of this resolution to acknowledge. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, so we'll skip down to uh, whereas Billy Brubrick provided Metro with dedicated service and commitment during the time of her employment, and whereas Daily Brubrick served Metro with distinction. And whereas the service provided to the residents of Santa Cruz County to Delhi Rubric resulted in reliable quality public transportation being available in the most difficult, difficult of times. And whereas during the time of this rubric service, Metro improved existing, existing and built new operating facilities, converted the fleet to a CNG propulsion system, developed accessible bus stops, improved ridership, responded to adverse economic conditions, assumed direct operational responsibility for Highway 17 Express Service and the Amtrak Connector Service, and assumed direct operational responsibility for the Paracruise Service. And whereas the quality of life in Santa Cruz County was improved dramatically as a result of the exemplary service provided by Dilly Brubrick. Now therefore be it resolved that upon her retirement as administrative assistant, the Board of Directors of Metro does hereby commend her efforts and advancing public transit service in Santa Cruz County and express a sincere appreciation on behalf of, its, of itself, the Metro staff, and all the residents of Santa Cruz County. Be it therefore further resolved uh, that a copy of this resolution be entered in the official records of the Santa Cruz Metro Transit District. So thank you to Ms. Brubrick and let's do a round of applause. It does. Okay. So I would move uh, adoption, approval of. Uh, yes, sir. That was all. Awesome. <laughs> the second and third. <laughs> this is the second. I think it was Director oh, okay. McPherson. Okay. Thank you. All right. Director Downey. <coughs> Director Dutra. Aye. Director Barry Johnson. Aye. Director Cummings. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Kiris Carter? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, item 12 is consideration of Santa Cruz Metro staff FY24 and FY25 operating budget and capital budget and resolution setting a public hearing on June 23rd. Mr. Farmer. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go through the budget. I went through this with the committee in kind of a little bit more in detail, so I'm going to stay a little bit on the high level. Please stop me if you have any questions. Like I said, it's for the reason why we're having this board meeting today, not a week from now, is the fact that we have to set up this 30 day period before we can go to the public hearing and get approval. So, uh, so to move on, 
I'm going to skip some of the slides, but kind of give you an idea of the budget itself. Primarily, back in uh, March, we present, I presented the budget on, in draft mode for approval for the RTC. And what I'm going to do is just kind of give you a couple items that have changed since then. So that's why I'm going to stay at kind of a high level. So since then, uh, we've actually made some slight increases in some of the revenue as well as some of the cost. Uh, one of the big things is we actually brought down our CNG fuel, so it's a saving of about almost $900,000. But uh, that's misleading because we are still up over 50% over FY23 because fuel costs are still pretty high. Uh, bottom line is we're making total changes of about uh, $685,000. So our bottom line went from $6.8 million before transfers to $7.5 million. So that's the changes that we've made. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to flip through these unless you want me to stop. One item I want to point out on the PL in FY24, if you go down to the non operating revenue on the budget, there's a line that says federal and state grants. We have a one time $4 million TDA STA monies coming in. It's only for FY24, and then it goes away. So just be aware that number is including that form. On the proposed FTE changes since the March board meeting, we, the mechanic one and two uh, that we defunded, uh, we initially had two of them, now we're only defunding one. We're defunding the customer service assistant. On the flip side, we are adding one mechanic three, not two mechanic three. We're adding the assistant pair crews and customer service manager and a parts and material service manager. So those are the changes on the FTEs. And that's, that's 24. And then in 25, we made uh, a few more changes. Uh, like I said, we've adjusted a little bit on our uh, revenue changes, which is our contracts and our passenger fares. A uh, big change right now on the expense side is the fact that we have no raises in here yet. Uh, our COLAs, cost of living adjustments, right now it's just steps and benefit changes. And that's driven about $1.4 million worse. Down at the very bottom, uh, we uh, are about $4.1 million lower than what uh, FY24, so we're coming in at about 3.4. Uh, there's some puts and takes between federal grants and COVID because we run out of our COVID money. So that's the $9 million uh, negative balance. But on the flip side, on our federal grants, that's our 5307, and that's slightly offset by that $4 million of STA, TDA funds that go. And that's where we get the six point. And then moving on to this slide, as you can see at the very bottom, uh, we go from 7.5 million operating surplus and deficit before transfers. Sorry, I don't have something I can point to to kind of show you this near the bottom. The 3.4, and that's about a 54% decrease. So if we stay on this trend, by the time we get to 26, we're zero, and then we start going negative. So some of the operating budget and risk, like I said, we baked in what we know, but there's always stuff above and beyond. So uh, unsure about ridership, there's always there could be a change that could flush it up and down. Again, we also have contracts with the colleges and so forth, you know, that could also uh, be changed. So that's a risk. Sales tax, TDA, uncertain. Inflation is creating a lot of issues and we're keeping our eye on, especially with sales tax. Um, you know, things are starting to flatten out, and if you start coming down, that's not baked into our budget, so that can have a bottom line uh, dramatic impact. Then, of course, with the FTA being the federal government, who knows where they're going to go, especially passing the budget and so on, that this could actually impact our 5307 and 5311 so money coming to us. Uh, economic downturn, floods, fires, and if we move on to the expense side, uh, you know, so the cost of you know engine failures, if we have that fuel cost uh, volatility, like we had in January, February, where fuel costs shot up 
out of the rooms <laughs> which are gradually coming down, but they're no way near where they were in December uh, last year. Uh, workers' comp insurance, medical, <laughs> you have settlement costs, if you have any type of settlement cost, and then of course, any type of other type of costs that come up. I'm not gonna go through each one, but you can read. On the capital side, on the capital side, uh, like I said, we have now included all the TERSA funding now that we know we have it. So as part of it, we're gonna receive 27 hydrogen buses. So this is now in our numbers. We're receiving 10, 10 of the CNG Arctic buses, seven pair of transit vans, five electric buses, and uh, right now the three, hopefully new flyer leases go away at the end of, end of the life. So, um, so right now we're looking about $34 million just in buses alone that we're gonna receive over the next few years, not just next year. And then on the construction related process, we're, we're really looking at the Paracruz facility. We're still holding money aside for that if that gets off the ground. Um, we've added another 500K for the Pacific Station redevelopment. We had 4 million, now four and a half, because we added the bikes as part of the Tercel grant. Hydrogen fueling station, that's $12 million. So we've added that in. 8 million of that is the Tercel, or 8 and a half is the, or 8 million is the Tercel grant. 3 million is our funding to get it off and going. Uh, SoCal Drive with the rapid bus enhancements, the other 9.5, that's coming from SoCal, that's coming from the Tercel grant. And then at the very bottom, Watsonville Station redevelopment, that's eight and a half million. So that's part of the Churchill Grant too. So the Churchill Grant is a great for us. Um, that's a very $38 million construction projects. And then moving to the next side, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but ultimately we're looking at a portfolio that is funded either by Churchill Grants or other grants at this point, $78.7 million. And in that, I'll break it down here almost 50% of that money is coming just from this Tercel grant we just won, so which is great news. Um, the rest of it is coming from our capital reserves right now, 15.8 of that, and then transfers from our operating budget of another 11.7, and then we have some federal grants, which, which is not a lot, FTA, it's only 6.7 million for 9% of this. So we're either coming with the money, the Tercel's coming up with it, and then we have some of discounts where we're getting some uh, the lawsuit with BW, we're getting some money back, which is 3.2, which is actually good news. And uh, that's really kind of where our fund is going. Now, that's the budget. And then the one thing that uh, Director Rock can ask is if, we can, if I could present the buckets. So um, I'm going to present the buckets right now. So here's where we stand on the buckets. This is our projection as of the end of June of this year, not the end of June of 24 or 25 after we've been spending the money, but as of you know a month and a half from now. Yeah, a month and a half. So I'm just gonna walk through, especially I know some new people here. So our workers' cop fund is 2.3 million. We hold that money, it's fully funded aside, and it's to cover all the working cops issues. We don't touch that money, and it just it just very little. Our liability insurance reserve fund. So this is our liability insurance. So we, this is matching money that we have to use as part of our liability funds. Uh, very little money, but still it's three million between those two buckets. Our operations, actually I'm gonna go to the far uh, right one at the very top. Our cash flow reserve fund, this is $3 million. So think of this is our working cash fund. So think of this as, you know, some we have to pay a lot of our stuff up front but we won't receive the money from the governments until later on, you know, two, three weeks, maybe in a month later. So we have to float that cash. And that's the money that we need in order to kind of keep money in our bank so we can pay our other bills too while we're waiting for that money to come in. So that's $3 million. And then our operations sustainability reserve fund, which is our 16.3, that is our three months worth of operating expenses. <laughs> Should something happen, like if the federal government shuts down, they stop sending this money, the state government shuts down, and we don't have money to come in, we can sustain operations for three straight months and pay our bills. So that's really what you're looking at there. Moving down to the bottom line, where we don't have kind of minimum balances or, or, or a defined balance. The first one is our bus replacement fund. 
So the bus replacement fund of $10.8 million, that is the $3 million that we set aside using, using major uh, D sales tax, as well as our um, STA, State of Good Repair funds. It's approximately $3 million every year. And this is to pay for our buses and matching uh, grants that we have for our buses. And right now it's currently $10.8 million, and that's already all reserved for the capital I just showed you because we have those 27 buses. So that's already been spent or going to be spent. On our operating and capital reserve fund of $13.2 million, um, these are uh, funding that we use above and beyond the bus. So for example, we have 3 million that's going with the Tursa grant to pay for this uh, hydrogen fuel tank across the street. We have uh, another, uh, I'm sorry, that was $3 million. We have another 4.4 million of matching funds for the SoCal corridor upgrade that's going in. So that's seven, uh, $7.4 million. And there's a whole bunch of others that are in this funding, but this covers a lot of other projects that are not kind of restricted to just buses. And that right now is 13.2, and that's all reserved in our budget that I just showed you on prior slides. The last one, all the way to the right, I'll cover that. So the UAL and OPEB, we've agreed that we're going to put $2 million set aside for our underfunding, you know, should our uh, pension go uh, not return the amount of money that we need, then we have to make up the difference, as well as if we had some kind of catastrophic uh, OPEB or basically uh, this is health insurance for retirees, if it ends up going too deep that we need to cover it. So this is our reserve fund for this, and it's $2 million set aside, and the bucket right now is $6 million. I can tell you that uh, uh, CalPERS has returned 6.1% negative funds in FY22, and they're supposed to return 6.8% positive as part of it. So you're talking about 12 to 13% um, lower return. So we will have not this year, in 25, a gap that we will have to make up because the returns were negative, not positive. So um, I'm just going to forewarn you, but it's not in here because I don't have the results locked in yet to figure out what that will be. But that's going to be millions of dollars. And then on our COVID recovery fund, the $13.5 million. So we're using that as we move through time and we need funding. This is to help help us recover from COVID. And I ain't saying not really COVID, but little economic downturns, whatever the case may be, to keep us afloat as we're going. And currently right now, the 31.5, that puts us approximately into like FY, end of FY29, uh, before we actually run out of money and hit that cliff. And this does not contemplate any type of, like say cost of living adjustments or anything of that nature. Um, so we have to be very cautious on what we're doing, not just that, but just in general moving forward so we can extend this 31.5 or any other funding that we receive farther in the future. So I know it's still far out, it's just right around the corner. So um, we've got to kind of keep our eye on the future so we don't run out of money. That's it, I think that would be it on. So I've got some few more things um, I'm not going to go through, uh, this is the explanation if you have any questions on the different buckets, and then some additional information that we always present for the budget. So this is supporting activities that we're going to be doing. Um, and then here's a listing of all the different memberships on here, should you have any questions on it. I'm not going to go through each one because there's two pages of this. Actually, I'm sorry, three pages. And it's about 100,000, it's going to about 107,000 next year. And then here's a couple of the board member possible budget uh, of uh, different conferences to go to, possibly. Uh, big one is after meetings, and then the next one is CTA. Could be more. And then some employee incentive programs. I think the big thing, and Mike will probably talk about it, is the agency rodeo, some awards, employee appreciation, and so on. And then lastly is the timeline, and we are in May, which is the bottom left. And by presenting this to, like I said, it's gonna be going out to everybody to review. We're gonna come back on the 23rd for a public hearing at nine o'clock in the morning and say yes or no. And if we say yes, that finishes out our budget timeline and we're good to go. 
any questions? Thank you. Um, it's good to see fully funded across the top because back in 2014, it was nothing like that. It was doomsday every single day. So um, we're at the point where I thought even Metro's probably have to shut down because there was just no money. Um, I have a few questions for you. Uh, one is, how much does it cost to uh, run a bus every single day? Like once, once it used fuel that we're gonna be taking off on the streets. What does it cost usually or what a month or a year? How much do you think each bus costs? I mean, the actual fuel itself? Yes, fuel itself. The different buses? Fuel itself and how much the cost of the, running that bus would be, because we are switching over, so. You're talking about between the difference between a, a hydrogen bus versus a CNG bus and the cost of running the different two? Yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd like to know what the savings, I'd like to know what the savings is gonna be um, now that we're moving over, we're, we're, we're moving over, you know, the kind of buses we're left over out on the streets. But initially, it's going to be a lot more expensive. I, I can tell you, I don't oh, have the answer to the to, to the, uh, the dollar figure yet. Um, but I can tell you because hydrogen fuel is more expensive and the hydrogen buses are more expensive. Initially, it is going to be more expensive to run a hydrogen bus than it is for a CNG. But as What's out in the market is saying that hydrogen fuel is going to start dropping and dropping as they start building these plants to deliver it. It should flip so that the hydrogen fuel is actually cheaper than CNG. And then, therefore, you're going to start seeing the benefit of the hydrogen buses actually becoming cheaper. Oh, I, I thought, I mean, well, I guess going greener is not always cheaper, right? So, <laughs> what, was I, what was I thinking? I thought, I thought there was going to be some sort of savings because of the transition that we're making um, from our buses, but it sounds like it's going to be more expensive. So, just to kind of give you an idea, just the buses alone, uh, the the gross price, not what we pay, but the gross price of a hydrogen bus is about 1.4 million. For CNG, it's 800. But we're getting rebates against the 1.4 million, and that's going to get us down to roughly a million dollars, maybe. But it's still going to be a little bit more expensive than the 800. And you're right, we're we're still a ways away before it kind of flips. Yeah. Right, it's still going to be more expensive. It's, okay, so that, that means our costs are going to go up. Then uh, our costs are going to go up. Yes. So, okay. did, did that, does that play into what you were saying? How um, it seems like the budget's going to be. Uh, it's beautiful today, but it's maybe in a few years not looking so good. You have to be very cautious going forward because this is just twenty four and twenty five. We're going to start delivering these hydrogen buses come end of 25 into 26. We don't know the fuel price yet, but you know we're going to start delivering these buses. And at that point, we're going to then really take a hard look at you know how much does our cost go up, or do they stay the same, or do they go down? And it's really around the fueling price at that point. So we don't want to kind of overspend ourselves now to get ourselves in a hole in the future. So. So that, that hole is not a set hole, but a <clears throat> could be hole. Could be hole. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Could be here because it sounded like we were headed that we were going to be using a lot of that funding up. This is like well, we are. And this is just in general running. So if we stay, if let's assume that hydrogen and CNG remain the same, and hydrogen, by the way, does get better gas mileage than than CNG. So let's assume everything's equal. Then yes, we have a hole, and we know exactly where it's at. But we know the pricing is going to be different. We just don't know where the pricing is at that point in time. And like I said, it's if it comes way down, it's great, <laughs> but if it stays up, then that hole shrinks and it, and it closes the gears to FY28 or And so the bucket that said COVID recovery, I think it had 30, a little over 30, 31 million, 31 million in it. Um, that's going to be depleted, right? Or is that'll that be depleted it? by the end of FY29 at this point right now with okay. the so that bucket will be gone. Um, so we're going to have to actually find some other funding that we're using that money, I'm sure, for um, other reasons. So that money is going to be that we're using it. We're going to need to figure out how we're going to replace it. But, have we been thinking about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Trust me. We're thinking about different ways. And I think, you know, Michael probably allude to it. I think some people have talked about it. Um, uh, but for the most part, yes, we're looking for another way to now so that in the future we'll have some other mechanism of funding in the way to support, you know, to, uh, bridge that gap and take this into like, you know, possibly, you know, 24. Yeah, and I think that's good that we're, we're thinking about it now because I don't want to be putting it back in the same position where, okay, now we're short, you know, 
X amount of dollars and where we're going to get that money and everyone's kind of stressed out that we need to cut, you know, fares and routes and service. So um, even further, because we weren't thinking about how to replace that funding. Um, and then I think that was next. Thank you. Okay. And that kind of discussion we talked about going to voters and what approach and what would be the best way and in the past meeting on on whether there's sales tax those options will be coming back to us with the research that you were talking about doing right yeah and that's why it's important is, is the right. sales tax because mm -hmm. we're looking at in the future and making sure that we sustain our ability to go forward without running into like the 2014 hiccup where we're cutting the world or sustain the service, so. so we're trying to get out ahead of that. I have one more question. Sorry, um, the Paracruise facility. I feel like we've been talking about this forever as well. Um, it, what's going on with the funding for that? Is that what's holding it back, or what's the? Why are we kind of just every year just we see it in there, but we're not saying anything? Yeah, it um, it's like you got an update. I don't. Yeah, I mean it's a so that it's currently under development, the preliminary design and engineering with the housing. And uh, so we've got a meeting coming up next week with the architect, uh, with Brian Spector, to kind of get the floor where we're at. That one's uh, perhaps a little more tricky to fund from a state mm -hmm. and a federal level, just given its location. Um, so long story short, I mean, it's still in design and engineering. Um, and we're trying to figure out the game plan on how to get the gap funding piece together for it. Okay. okay. I'll add that to, to be able, we're gonna, we're gonna meet, I think, next week, so we can have yeah, we check on that as well. That'd be great. Thanks. So I'd like to follow up on kind of the thread that Jimmy introduced, and that's, do we have any knowledge across the industry yet about possible maintenance cost savings as we shift to hydrogen and other sources? I think of myself switching from an ICE car to an EV, I'm spending a lot less on many things. Uh, is there a parallel for transit? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Margo Ross. Uh, yes, there is savings in the maintenance side. Yeah. You're not dealing with engines and right. transmissions and things like that. Um, we'll have to analyze the cost, certainly, but know that there is a big savings. We are actually gearing up to um, have our facility ready for hydrogen um, fueling. Um, so, you know, that's one of our, our, our goals in the next year. Uh, but yeah, there certainly is a cost savings. Great. Thank you. Obviously, the projection of ridership um, get into this exactly. Um, are you embedded in this? Is this ridership is going to improve 25, 6, 7, whatever? Yeah, ridership continues for every single year. And like I said, the one thing we don't have is fare increases. So, you know, really it's just ridership at the same fare prices. You know, not to say we're going to go out there and charge people, but it also doesn't do the other thing. We, do, we did make an adjustment for the free fares for uh, continuing on for everybody under 18 and uh, the students. But if we decide to take that a little step further and add other people into that mix of free fares, it's not included. So that could be an impact on, fare, um, on our pricing. Right. Okay. Um, you other questions from directors? Okay, I'll take it out to public comment. Just one minute. Oh, sorry. Brandon Freeman, Senior Vice Chair of Local 23. Um, I don't have any issues with it. I just wanted to thank publicly both Don and Chuck. I think I've made Chuck go over that with me like nine times over the last month. Um, and when we got into the FTEs, I had concerns as well, but I just wanted to let the board know that Don made sure to address those with me. Margo, Daniel, Anna Marie, and these two met with me yesterday for about an hour. So we are comfortable with the FTE changes at this point. I just want to make sure that you guys knew that. I know that I had spoken to a couple of you that maybe we weren't, but we are. That everything's figured out, so we're good to go. Thank you. Thank you for making the time to do that. Anyone else? Anyone online? Um, yes. Uh, you have Kate Bow. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just want to let you know that um, I got an email 
um, almost quite a while ago about um, reimagine Metro, like any plans that's going on has to do with ridership or something, and also like planning plans to reroute some of the bus routes Santa Cruz Metro. So, which I didn't know at the time, and that's when I got involved. So, um, so I just want to let you. So I want to thank you for um, trying to get this taken care of, and um, I'm hoping that this could all work out for the for this whatever's going on with the rerouting of bus routes in Santa Cruz County especially for one of the arrangements regarding Scotts Valley which I think has to do with Scotts Valley Drive or something so um and um I'm also hoping that more bus drivers are getting more hired to prevent further cancellations of bus trips so that is all I um that's all I wanted to say thank you thank you for your comments Hey, we don't have any more from anyone here. We'll take it back to uh, the board for a motion. Second. Thank you. Oh, that was due to that. You guys probably. Great. Right, Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director Newton? Aye. Director Newton? Aye. Director Pagler? Aye. And Director Felix Carter? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Okay. We are now on item 13, and that is um, a public hearing for the adoption of California Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act ordinance to provide informal bidding procedures for public projects. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I'm gonna pass it to Julie Sherman. Yeah, thank you. And I'm gonna call it Kupka, so I don't have to <laughs> the same your thing next time. Uh, so this is a continuation of the process that was started last month when the board had its first reading of this ordinance and adopted a resolution to opt into the CUPCA program. This program will allow the agency to use informal bidding processes for the purpose of small value in particular, small and medium value public works projects so that staff has an easier time you know, letting those projects out to bid and getting successful bids. So this is all to help staff and the agency um, have more success getting small and mid-value public projects completed. And so this first part is the public hearing to take <coughs> public comments on adoption of this ordinance. And then, then you'll go into the next item where you'll actually adopt the ordinance. At that time, you don't have to take more public comment. You can, but this is the public comment part. Now, hand it back to you. Thank you. Is there anyone here who would like to comment on, on this? It's your opportunity. Anyone online? Okay, then I'd like to close the public hearing and I think that's all we need to do for that item, is that right? Correct. Okay, so now we'll move to item 14 and that is to waive the second reading and adopt an ordinance um, to provide informal bidding procedures for the CUPCA uh, for public projects and adopt a resolution to amend Title II of the Administrative Code Procurement Policy. <coughs> um, so let me just ask if there are any questions. I have one. Is did our organization who we're doing this have any um, procedures in place to keep deep purchases within the county so that we're getting our own tax? Uh, well, that's a good question, and it's a complicated answer. Um, there, there are certain. Uh, well, it, it depends on funding, and there's like if you have FTA funding, you're not allowed to have a geographic preference. Um, it's actually illegal. It's a limit on competition. There are some exceptions for that for A and E contracts, because at least there you might say, well, this you know, design firm has a particular knowledge of this particular area, and then you can get away with it. Um, so 
out, but then outside of the funders, you know, if you have just local funds, if you have a, a really good business case to make um, for having, you know, a geographic preference, you might be able to do it. It's a, yeah, it's complicated. Um, but then you do have small business and disadvantaged uh, business enterprise outreach and that they do focus on local firms doing the outreach. Um, but this agency has has never had geographic preferences. It's certainly something that you could, you know, as a board member, the agency could ask staff to look into and see, you know, if if that's something the agency wanted to do um, outside of a federally funded context. Um, you may or may not have success because this area, it can be difficult to get folks to bid on projects locally. Um, but legally, it's something that you could do in some circumstances. So there's your complicated legal answer. Well, sometimes if you just put the checkbox there as you're making purchases, it's just brings it to mind so that people say, oh, yeah, maybe I should check locally first um, just to see so that that expense, if there's any tax involved, is here. And I, I don't know if anyone is here from the contracts office, but okay. they might be best to answer how they go about doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Um, I will give another opportunity to see if there's any public comment. Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back for a motion. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. and pay player. Downey? Aye. Director Beecher? Aye. Director Collin Jerry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Baker? Aye. Director T. Rose Carter? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item 15, CEO oral report. Where? Goodness. <laughs> Well, um, I do. I do have just a few items, and I know you've got uh, probably some uh, discussion. We've got two closed sessions, so I'll keep my uh, comments fairly brief. But um, I did want to let you know we continue with the operations to make uh, headway, so to speak, with uh, getting more operators on board. Uh, since we last met, we've released five new operators into service, and uh, I guess I should put in the overall context: we're about 22 operators down, so we released five into service. We have 14 currently in the classroom. And then you have 72 applications for the subsequent class coming up behind that class. So, I uh, it's it's amazing to see what uh, Don and Margo put together as far as just getting the applications, getting the process, getting the interviews done, and Margo lining up these training classes. Just a lot of work behind the scenes, but. It's the number one priority that we have, which hopefully we will all get back to, uh, you know, 100% basically of uh, our operator positions being filled. And, uh, you know, our big goal is uh, to do that in the fall, but also when the university starts school in the fall to have all the bus routes at the university fully going, all the schedules fully filled, and they have the 10 R ticks. Uh, and as you saw in your, uh, Consent calendar today, you approved uh, the purchase of the 10 articulated buses from San Diego Metro, uh, $10,000 each, which is a pretty good buy considering they're probably about a $1.6 million bus. Um, they've got a little bit of a uh, life left on them, but certainly from a youth perspective, they're like 10 or 12 years younger than the current Arctics that are running on the street. So that'll be a, a big. Uh, at the university, I think, to be running those routes with articulated buses. Uh, yesterday, San Diego approved the purchase or the sale of the buses to, to Metro at their board. So this thing's just about all in depth and, and ready to go. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll actually sign all the paperwork today, and then it'll be done. We'll go get those uh, during the summertime, get them, uh, get them wrapped, get them uh, our pair boxes put in them, uh, and so on. So. I think there's good news. It's around the corner still, but um, we're making big, uh, big headway with getting that. Um, I did want to mention uh, 
yesterday, uh, there's always something interesting going on at Metro, I tell you, when it comes to passengers and, and drivers. And um, I just want to make sure that I got the name right. Um, we have an operator that was hired, <laughs> hired in uh, 2012, so he's been here about 11 years. And uh, yesterday, this operator was coming on uh, the route that serves uh, Cabrillo College and uh, noticed uh, uh, about a 20-year-old uh, young lady that was slumped over. So he pulled the bus over, tried to uh, get her to interact, saw that she couldn't, saw that she had a really weak pulse. And so he called uh, the paramedics, and they were able to revive her. And uh, so I, uh, I will make mention of that again, I think, coming up, and perhaps give a special award for, for Travis Havens. But uh, that kind of stuff just, you know, it almost happens on a regular basis. It's why they're called essential workers. Uh, not only are they getting people to places where they need to go, uh, providing an equitable environment for them to succeed in life, but uh, these guys also just see it in their hand and react to it and respond to it, including saving uh, the lives of folks. I remember last summer, uh, a similar situation happened with a man that was in a wheelchair uh, on Route 35, and uh, he had slumped over and uh, had gone into a heart attack, and the driver was able to call quickly the paramedics, and uh, that was a good outcome. So anyway, we'll bring Travis back at a, at a future date to have him recognized, but just, you know, it, it's it's going above and beyond, right? He's there to drive a bus, but when you see somebody and, you know, something's wrong, let's we'll put it in park and go out and take care of it. That. Um, I had just a couple of other things. Uh, there is a program called ARCHES, and I'm not sure what ARCHES stands for. I should have written it down. I had it in the back of my mind, but now it's blank. But the long story short of it is um, there's uh, about 20 transit uh, agencies in the state that are partnering with other vendors and experts on hydrogen. And so to be able to go after a sizable federal pot on building hydrogen plants where you actually build the hydrogen, we've all teamed up and come in as part of a consortium. And uh, we've made a pitch to have a hydrogen plant in Northern California, and then to be able to buy off of that as a consortium. And there's over a thousand hydrogen buses within the consortium when you add up all of the uh, transit agencies. And there's also others that I think are either in or coming into the consortium. It would be like trash, refuge trucks, and other heavy-duty vehicles, school buses, and so on. But the, the, it was just like Chuck was mentioning, the projection is we want to get the price of hydrogen uh, down to about $5 per gallon equivalent. And then uh, you also heard Chuck say there's better efficiency with hydrogen. So if you have a $5 gallon equivalent of hydrogen and a $5 gallon of diesel fuel, you'll get twice the mileage out of that gallon equivalent of hydrogen. So that's a that's a big deal. Uh, so there's a lot of things in motion. What was really interesting is we had submitted all this to the state, this ARCHES package, this consortium's proposal for a hydrogen plant. And Wandamu and I were back in Sacramento on Monday and Tuesday, and without even prompting our legislatures uh, about Arches, they already knew about it. It was already circulating back there with the legislature that this was a proposal that was likely to see some significant funding. So I just wanted to give you a heads up where we're being innovative, trying to, you know, not just look at the market price, but actually trying to influence it by coming together as an industry and proposing just good innovative projects. And that would be a hydrogen plant that has uh, a lot of green hydrogen associated with it through solar and through wind power. Um, still working on the South County facility. Uh, you had authorized me to negotiate a lease agreement. Um, we're going back and forth. I'm still uh, feeling that that will come together. Uh, part of the issue is a lot of people own that piece of property and have a lot to say in regard to lease price and, and so on. So uh, we're working with the broker that you have here at the agency. I just wanted to let you know we're still working on it. have not lost the lease by any stretch, but we're just trying to get the details hammered out on that. So hopefully at the next board meeting, I'll have uh, some, some news about that. And then we're also still looking for that opportunity. And, and I apologize for not having 
gotten that solidified since the last board meeting of really celebrating down in Watsonville that Tursa grant. Um, just a lot of funding for the Watsonville area in that grant. You need to consider the eight and a half million for the TOD, uh, the uh, housing component uh, for the uh, redevelopment of the Watsonville Transit Center. Um, there were a lot of things in motion. You would, without Watsonville, you wouldn't have got the grant. Let me just put it that way, just based on the fact that Watsonville has some advantages they bring into our agency that allow you to go out and be aggressive with the grants. And then uh, I just uh, couldn't say enough about uh, your mayor. It more than one scene in the phone calls that he made all of a sudden made him sit down with uh, the deputy secretary of transportation. I mean, that was so with that, I'll, uh, I'll back off and be quiet. Other than uh, one other thing, actually, uh, July 22nd, we'll send this info out, but July 22nd, we kind of locked in a date for the company picnic, the agency picnic that we have each uh, summer. I have it over at the JKS building and also have associated with it a, a rodeo for the company, for the drivers to be able to come out and show off their skills while we're having the picnic. And, uh, you know, Margo would kill me to say this, but I'd love to see the board members get behind the wheel of the bus. And get behind the <laughs> Give a mini training session, but uh, to take it through a few pounds, I think. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but with that, there I am. That's all. Thank you. Well, I'm really sad I'll be out of town for that. <laughs> um, are there questions or comments? <clears throat> CEO or on the floor? I actually had a question. Um, the story you shared about the bus driver supporting the, the person who was left over and unresponsive, that's, um, that's really incredible that our bus drivers are doing that. Um, I'm wondering if we have Narcan available on our buses, and if not, if that's something we can work towards. Um, that probably goes beyond the scope and responsibility of a bus driver, but it could save lives. Yeah, I think we've begun having discussions about that, about uh, whether our insurance provider will be okay with that and just yeah. what are the other liabilities that sure. might be associated. But you're right, it seems to be a timely remedy for a lot of uh, a lot of issues out there. Okay, great. I'm glad we're exploring it. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions or comments, we will um, move on to um, getting into our closed session, and I'd like to ask Julie Sherman to just make some comments. Sure, we have two closed sessions. The first is a public employee performance evaluation for the CEO position, and then the second is conference with labor negotiators, and that will involve uh, an update on labor negotiations for all three of Metro's bargaining units. Thank you so much. So I'd like to ask um, members of the public and staff to please step out. While we, oh, I'm sorry. Public comments on either of the, any of those items. Thank you for reminding me. Is there any? Are there any public comments online? There were none. Okay. 